thank you for the introduction and thank you for coming today. Um, as Rachel mentioned, today we'll be speaking about Snapper. This is the fish I conduct pretty much all of my research on at NEWA. And I like to thank Snapper as New Zealand's favourite fish. And there's quite a few reasons for that. They are abundant. They're a major part of our coastal ecosystem. They're prone to capture and we all enjoy the sport that they can provide and they taste good. And as far as I know, they're the only fish that's had a popular book written on them in New Zealand. So what is snapper? Well, the, the scientific name is Pagras auratus. Um, well, that's actually changing back to what it was 20 years ago. That, that kind of thing happens quite a bit. It's changing back to Chrysophora auratus. Um, they're a part of the sparrow or porgy family, and this is a family which is quite widely distributed throughout the world. Mediterranean, Africa has um, about 40, um, South Africa has about 40 um, species that look quite similar to our snapper. Not to be confused with tropical snappers, which um, are part of the Lugjanin family. They look very similar, but a very different family. Or golden snapper, which we have here, which um, you can catch in slightly deeper water. So these are, these are all different families. The distribution of snapper, so they're found through, you can, you can see that in the, the blue colouring here, so that they're found throughout the North Island and the top of the South Island, also in Norfolk Island and parts of Australia, and it was thought that they were found in Asia, but that's actually a sister species, a very similar species in Japan and Taiwan. Um, they, they also uh, um, used to be captured quite frequently down as far south as Dunedin in the 1920s. They were quite a common capture and in uh, prehistoric times Maori caught them in the Catlins area they found in middens from um, that area. They're most abundant however on the North Island's east coast and in fisheries management circles this is termed the area Snapper 1, so up here. In that area they occupy most habitats, pretty much all habitats, down to about 200 metres deep. And areas like the Hauraki Gulf, which are large sheltered embayments, or um, say the Tasman Golden Bay area, or the Bay of Islands, these large embayments, for some reason, are really important to snapper. They're kind of centres for snapper. So, early Maori fisheries. Well, Maori arrived in New Zealand about 1280 AD, and pretty much as soon as they arrived, they started to exploit snapper as a really available food resource. And they developed quite sophisticated fishing techniques. So down in the Moana exhibition, you might have seen some hooks, which looked quite similar to this. But beyond that, Maori also um, developed, come from the sea, from um, the bones, um, and looking at the chemical composition of them, you can tell how much of their diet was marine in origin. And then looking at middens, or the, the rubbish dumps of Maori at the time, looking at the, 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 the stuff that's deposited in the ground in those areas, we can get the proportion of that marine part of the diet that was snapper. So that's how we get to the 1600 tonne estimate. And with these techniques of catching a, a large amount of fish, Murray were able to supply European settlers quite well up until about the 1870s. At about this time, uh, early commercial fisheries started to develop. So initially they were largely hand, lo hand, hand lines and hooks and um, small set nets from Small boats like this, they're called mullet boats, they're quite fast sailing boats, um, and that's what most of the snapper was caught from it, that, right back in the, um, the late 1800s. But then there's a, as the fish um, kind of got harder to catch or spots got um, depleted, more efficient methods started to develop. So from about 1899, beam trawling um, started to occur. So what, what beam trawling is, is um, it's a net that's towed behind a boat and it has a large wooden beam like a telegraph pole that um, keeps the mouth of the net open so it can get pulled through the water and capture the fish. Uh, long lining from about 1912, so long lining is a long line with lots and lots of hooks on it, rather than just the hand line with one or two hooks, so that's more efficient. And then steam trawling, so steam trawlers are steam powered, large steam powered vessels, and rather than having that beam that kept the net open, they have what's called otter boards, so these large metal doors that um, as the net gets pulled through the water they, they get forced out and they, they keep the net open so it can catch the fish. And then Danish seining from about the 1920s. So Danish seining is rather than pulling the net through the water, the net gets paid out with a lot of rope 
and then the net gets pulled back to the boat, the, bo the boat basically stays still. And that allowed the use of um, vessels with a lot lower horsepower, so smaller diesel engines were able to do this. It's a very efficient method that's still used today. So, um, we had this evolution of the different fishing techniques, and we also had a serial depletion of this, the locations, basically the ones closest to Auckland got overfished initially, and then the, um, the 1980s at about 11,000 tonne per year for Snapper 1. And the, one of the biggest impacts though was in Tasman Bay at the top of the South Island. So what we saw there was um, they actually figured out that the fish were schooling near the surface in spring, they were probably spawning. They spotted them from planes, so that um, persainers which try and catch pelagic fish like kawai and mackerel and tuna were operating in the area and they saw these red schools and they um, directed some of the boats to them and they buoyed their, net up, their nets up rather than trawling with the nets on the bottom like you usually would, they buoyed the nets up and they kind of captured these large schools. And um, unfortunately the first time they did this it was pretty much Christmas and when they landed the fish there wasn't anyone there to process it and everyone was on holiday so there wasn't anyone to buy it. So the first lot ended up in the tip in Nelson, unfortunately. Uh, this fishery lasted for about three or four years and um, then those schools just stopped appearing. And that's what led us to the quota management system. And really, the things like the, the decline of snapper up until the early 1980s is what brought, brought about the quota management system. And it really saved snapper. Uh, so what this means is that fishers are given, or commercial fishers, are given a property right so they allocated an individually transferable quota so they can, they can sell it or they can lease it out and there's no incentive for them to race out and catch as many fish as soon as they can. They have an overall catch limit so they, no, they don't want to exceed that otherwise there's penalties. And um, for Snapper 1, as I mentioned before, that catch limit now is set at about 4,500 4, tonne. Um, so with the quota management system in place, that caused a halt to the um, decline of snapper. Um, so I'll just go through this graph here. So we have um, time and years along the bottom, so um, this is kind of present day out here. And then up here we have the landings of snapper, which are in black. And there's quite a few different things that influence that. Um, so steam trawlers getting acquired by the Navy for, um, uh, during World War II and then get returning to the Navy, and then they became uneconomical, this old technology, and then the, the industry became de-licensed, and that opened up for a lot more effort to be put in the industry, and we see a large increase in the catch. And then at the same time, in this, we've got this red line, this is the, our estimate of the biomass of what's out there, in terms of um, what's out there in Snapper 1, how many Snapper there are. And that decreases as all, the, all these large catches are occurring. But then the QMS comes in, quota management system around about here, and it levels off, and now we think that the biomass of snapper is increasing. So since the quota management system has been in place, there's been more changes in the commercial fishery. So uh, long lining became really important, um, specifically for the Japanese market. So they'd fly across representatives from Japan, that would tell them uh, how they wanted their fish uh, kept and treated. So the fish are caught uh, alive, that they come, most of them come onto the boat alive and are brain spiked or ickied. So that um, increases the flesh quality. And then they're thrown in an ice slurry like this. So it drops the temperature right, right down. They're then flown over to Japan uh, within about 36 hours and they're at that market really quickly and they can get a lot more money for this last year. So one of them we call an aerial overflight. So you can see here a little Cessna and some fishing boats. And what happens is uh, we send up about three planes at the same time and they fly a different part of the Snapper 1 area simultaneously. And when they see a boat on the water that looks like a recreational fishing boat, it gets recorded. And that's what these locations refer to, where over the entire year where recreational fishing boats were seen. So the, um, the warmer colours, the greens through to the reds and browns, represent high recreational fishing effort. And you can see it's, off, it's near population centres like Auckland, so Motohe Channel, Rangitoto Channel, and then also um, off the mussel farms of Coromandel are um, intensively fished by recreational fishers. So when those flights are happening, at the, at the same time there's about 13 popular boat ramps throughout this area where 
and there we will have representatives interviewing people as they come across the boat ramp and measuring their and counting their catch. And um, combining these two things, where the boats were where the boats were seen and how many boats were seen and and, um, and the catch of those boats, multiply that up over the year, counting for public holidays and weekends and weekdays, and we get a catch estimate of around about 3,800 tonne for that snapper one area. At the same, in the same year, uh, what we call a large-scale multi-species survey was also conducted. So what that involves is uh, uh, people ringing up uh, survey respondents routinely throughout the year and asking them whether they've been fishing and if so, what they've caught. And that also provided an estimate that was within 1.5% of this 3,800 tonnes. So we know quite a bit about how many snapper are caught in Snapper 1 and for Harrogate Gulf. That was about 2,400 of that 3,800 tonne. So what does the future hold? Well, I'd, I'd like to think that at some stage we may go to a broader whole ecosystem approach. So what, what do I mean by this? Well, part of it is taking into account all aspects of the life cycle of snapper and all the different parts of the environment that influence snapper. So here I've got a photo of snapper spawning on the surface. This was taken in a small harbour just south of Perth in Western Australia. I had not heard of anyone that's seen anything like this in New Zealand, uh, but that's how, that's how it happens over in Western Australia. So spawning snapper through to the little juvenile snapper, which settle out after, after that through to the adults. What are the different requirements of all these parts of the life cycle? Another aspect that's important is considering that fishing affects more than just the fish. It can also affect the environment that the fish are in. So the example I've got up here, which was also down in Moana, is that uh, is from the Lee Marine Reserve. So when the Lee Marine Reserve was created and predator populations such as snapper and crayfish were able to recover, grazed down the populations of these herbivores, kinna or sea urchin. So they're herbivore, they eat plants. So their population is being suppressed by the predators, which have been now recovered and we get the algae, the, the base of the food chain, or the kelp, recovering. So that creates a more productive environment, which can ultimately feed back to snapper populations potentially as well. We also might want to consider that the requirements of all the, the different requirements of recovering in some areas. So last year we started to do research in Whangarei Harbour. So if you're familiar with Whangarei Harbour, um, this is One Tree Point. And that's the same, same one tree point up there. And you can see these dark circular patches, uh, patches of seagrass. Five years ago, none of this seagrass was present. And when, there has been some sea, seagrass re-establishment programs, but we're not sure if that's what caused this um, recovery to occur. There may be something to do with clearing up of the water quality, because seagrass is a plant that needs the light, so the water gets murky, um, and it, it struggles to live, and it has to live in shallower water. Um, and then I've just got a little uh, video clip here of what happens on those seagrass beds in summer. So you can see here, uh, there's lots of tiny little snappers, so they're about 40, 40 millimetres or 4 centimetres in length, these fish. And they hover around over the seagrass beds during summer for, for two or three months before they leave and they go to deeper water in the channels of the harbours or out to the coastal environments. So it just kind of emphasises the point that... Um, that those, uh, those estuarine areas in harbours, while they might not be where you're catching large snapper, although you can catch them there, um, they are really important to the coast, having large snapper in coastal areas in, in the ocean because they, they supply the snapper to those areas, even though it's spatially disconnected. We also uh, want to consider trying to understand biodiversity. So usually when you say biodiversity, you think, or more than one species, but there's potential that we also have diversity even within the snapper population. So here I've got a picture of a, a large hump-headed dark kelpie snapper that was caught over Rocky Reef. And you can see there's tags in these fish as we were conducting a tagging program. And here I've got a picture of what we might call a school fish. Um, so bright coloured sharp teeth and potentially moving larger distance. So we conducted a tagging program to try and address this exact question, whether the movement behaviour of the fish was linked to the habitats 
that they were occupying. So we tagged about 10,000 snapper throughout the Haraki Gulf. And so what this graph or this map of the Haraki Gulf shows is the release locations of fish that were recaptured. So there's about a thousand points on this map. It, we released about another 9,000 fish, but they didn't get recaptured. So we did these releases in three main areas. So up here near Lee and Kowau, we've got green triangles. They represent um, fish that were tagged over shallow rocky reef areas. Down in the inner Haraki Gulf, we've got these brown circles, which represent fish that were tagged in these shallow muddy areas. And out in Waiheke, in the Noisy Islands, we've got these blue squares, which represent snapper, which were tagged in this slightly deeper, but also soft sediment bottom water. And if we look at the recapture locations of these fish over the next two or three years, what we see is that up here in Lee, pretty much all of the green triangles are very close to where the fish were originally released, on average about the size of a fingernail. And if we cut that in half and grind it down till it's smooth and then they put a flame across it, it increases the contrast, you can see there's rings, just like a tree. And if you count those, it gives you the age of the fish. So, uh, what we get from that, we'll do this for thousands of fish, and we get a, a relationship between the length and the age. So here we've got age across the bottom and the length up the side. So this is for the west coast. That is a really fast growing stock. So the, and there's also not a lot of variation. It's a narrow spread around that line. Whereas the Hauraki Gulf, we see the growth is about half as fast and there's a lot more variation. So what this tells us is that these two fish could actually be the same age. It's entirely plausible. So this is a 28 centimetre or half kilo fish. And this is a 60 centimetre, 4.1 kilo fish. They could both be 15 year olds. In general though, for the Haraki Gulf, a fish of around about a kilo or 36 centimetres in length is probably going to be 10 years old. And we kind of step through to your 9.1. I'll put that there because that's 20 pound, which is kind of the magical trophy mark for snapper. That is probably going to be a 35 to 45 year old fish. Um, we have aged even larger snapper that um, taxidermists give us the air bones out of them sometimes. They're not always the oldest fish. They'll generally come up in this bracket here. The oldest fish that have been aged have been in the 60s. So um, I think 65 was the oldest one. That was actually a fish from Ian Nelson. And it was only about a 7 kilo fish. So what is large? Well, um, before I mention the work that we do... I'll just come over to you, sir, with the microphone. Thank you very much, Darren, and I'm sure it has um, set up a number of questions. Thank you. Uh, the photo you showed of uh, West Australia with the surplus spawning snapper, yep. um, the, uh, they closed down their fisheries during spawning, uh, and this could be part and parcel of the reason that you see this sort of thing. Why don't we do this here? Okay, yeah, so the, um, th that is a management question, so, but um, the, the reason that we don't close down the spawning, um, fishing during spawning is because the, um, the success of spawning in any one year is really tightly um, related to the water temperature in that year. So basically if we have a really warm year, it means that we're probably going to get good snapper recruitment. And the, the way the fishery works <laughs> is that um, from that ageing work that we do with the odolids, it shows that um, it's not, you don't get the same number of fish coming through the fishery from, from every year's spawning. There's the odd good year, and that will prop up the fishery for quite a while until those fish grow through or, or get caught. But basically, um, the temperature is a far more important determinant of that year class strength, which is what's going to prop up the fishery. But that will be the same in West Australia as well. well well, it, it, could, it is a very different system over there, different oceanography, so water temperatures and climate. Um, but we're talking about a fishery over there that is far smaller than, than here in terms of the, the, the biomass and the, the, the amount of catch over there. They are also really tightly, really tightly aggregated in different spawning areas. So they have this behaviour, for example, whereas I haven't, I haven't heard of anyone's seen this in New Zealand, I'd be really interested if someone has. 
Um, so that they've actually also got um, boxes out in the out in, in Shark Bay over there where they where they close down um, the fishing during during spawning just in specific areas because they know that's where the fish are spawning. Whereas in New Zealand, there's spawning that does occur, but it's uh, it, I mean it, it is an aggregation, but there are lots of aggregations and it's spread out over a, a much wider area. It is it not so though that the, uh, we don't do it because the um, industrial fishing industry likes to target during spawning when all the fish are bunched up together? I, yeah, I, 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 I don't know if that's what occurs or not. I mean, that, that's a question that would have it to go to. I, mean, I, do, I do research on, on the fish stocks which goes to managers and managers make decisions about that. So the Ministry of Primary Industries, that's really not my area to be answering, unfortunately. Oh, sorry. Darren, do they um, still use for snapper fishing box nets? Um, if you go back to uh, the 70s, and Sea Lord actually had that water into Sea harvesters from Denmark, and they, they were doing the box net fishing. One was certainly down in the Coromandel, and there was another location as well. Uh, I actually had the privilege of going up one day on one of their fish, and you know, snap. I just wondered if they still. The seagrass for, for being a juvenile um, nursery. Mm -hmm. Could you, do you have any comments about, say, mangroves in, in that respect? And well, they may or may not play. Yeah. Um, so seagrass is subtitle, um, so the fish can stay, the juvenile snapper can stay over it regardless of the title state. Um, the, the mangroves are, fur, are, are further up. Um, I haven't done any research in mangroves myself, so I, I don't really know if they are that important for juvenile snapper, but um, I would imagine that it's habitats that are in slightly, slightly deeper areas that are important for the snapper of that size bracket that I'm talking about, which is about um, 20 to 50 millimetres in length. Uh, there's a potential though that um, snapper could initially be settling to a different habitat before they move to places like seagrass beds. But they're so small and cryptic, it's, you know, it can be really difficult to nail down those things. So mangroves could come into that, I just, I just don't know. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, with the, how much cross-species research goes on in this country? Uh, for argument's sake, if you take one species out of the biomass, such as kawai, for argument's sake, mm. what happens to other species, uh, much as seabirds, penguins, etc., etc.? Yes, that, that's a really interesting question. That's, um, I mean, so stock, fish stocks are usually managed on a single species basis, so um, and this is what I'm trying to get at in the second half of my talk, that kind of that broader ecosystem approach would take into account uh, if, if we take out a, a forage fish like, um, like pilchards, if we've got some remo removal of that, that may have an effect on snapper populations. Um, that, and around the world, everyone is grappling with trying to address questions ex exactly like that. In New Zealand, we're kind of just starting to go down that path of um, multi-species um, assessments and taking into account things like that. So it's, it's, it's early days is basically what I'll say. Yeah, it's my understanding that to date there really hasn't been anything much in, in uh, cross-species research, particularly <coughs> at, at the commercial and industrial fishing level. Yeah, we're just starting on it in the last couple of years. It's, it's, there's a couple of programs that are, that are starting to, um, to work in that area. Uh, Darren, once snapper reach maturity, do they breed consistently throughout the course of their life then, or do they increase in breeding potential or decrease as they get older? What's the story there? Yeah, so um, the general rule with fish is that as they get larger, the amount of gametes, so eggs or sperm that they produce, increases exponentially. So um, a, a larger fish is going gonna, is gonna to produce a lot more eggs than a smaller fish. <coughs> Um, but my question is about um, the best 
fish guy that's put up by Forrest and Bird. Mm. According to that, we shouldn't be eating snapper, but looking at your slide there with the population, it looks like it is okay. What's the story? Yeah, so um, there's a lot of things that go into a guide like that. It's not just about the status of the stock, so how healthy the snapper population is. Um, there's also considerations about what other species are caught, whether there's any threatened species that might be caught as part of um, the fishery for snapper, like marine mammals or, or birds, for example. Um, also, you've got to consider the other, um, just showing graphs mostly for snapper one, which is one area, and it's the area that has um, probably the, the, um, the best response in terms of population recovery. Um, some of the other snapper stocks aren't in as good a state as snapper one, so the, the forest and bird guide um, makes an overall assessment, my understanding, um, on all those considerations across all snapper fisheries. So that's probably why there's um, maybe a differential of what you, you're, you're seeing from that compared to that one graph that I showed there for the snapper stock and snapper one. Yeah, hi Darren. Um, there's been quite a bit of talk in the media lately about um, measures that may affect recreational fishermen. Um, we've all heard about the potential of reducing the keepable limit per day and also increasing the keepable size. The first part of the question is, of the two, do you favour one above the other? And the second part of the question is, uh, towards increasing the biomass generally, would we favour more controls on commercial fishermen or recreational? Yeah, I, I, I can't answer either of those questions, unfortunately. It would be inappropriate for me to have an opinion. I'm, I've got to make sure that I'm independent. Um, I, I mean, as I said before, I do research which goes to people in the Ministry of Primary Industries and they're the other ones who make those decisions about ex exactly what you're talking about there. I'm just running around back down on a question on your bike to Thanks very much for the session, by the way. Uh, I'm a recreational fisherman and I'm interested in solutions and uh, to try and increase the biomass. I'd like your views on a couple of things uh, because they're not particularly well covered in the statement that's been put out by the Ministry of Primary Industries. The first thing is that I've heard that the amount of nitrogen that comes out of the Thames area because of the cows down there is equivalent to 7 million human beings. And uh, I'm just wondering what your views are and what's happened in the first Thames with nitrogen and also the depletion of the mussel stocks that are down there and whether in fact if that was turned around that would have a major positive benefit. The second thing has to do with the uh, Go Island uh, sort of situation and uh, what your views would be about whether, if that was duplicated or reproduced ten times in the area you got, would that make in fact a substantial contribution to this biomass? I'd just like your views if you can. Okay, um, so with the further Thames, um, yeah, eutrophication or um, nutrients like nitrogen going into the, the sea, um, what, you, what happens there is, um, or you also get the sediments going in, which it can also you know, have, have quite large effects. Um, but the, the, the nutrients cause phytoplankton blooms, um, which make the water murky, and then they, they in turn die, and they can make the water anoxic, and um, in, in other words, they take the oxygen out of the water potentially. So the, yeah, the, I don't know if it's the equivalent of seven million um, people or not, or, or, or whatever it is, but it is it is a concern. Um, eutrophication and sedimentation in places like the Firth of Thames, um, especially considering that the Firth of Thames, the top of the Firth of Thames, of, um, near Pomoe Island and around, is an important um, spawning area for snapper. Um, so, yep, that that would be a valid concern um, about the mussel reefs in that area. So they've been gone since about the 1960s. Um, it's, it's pretty difficult to kind of back cast and kind of figure out what the effect would be of, of reintroducing them or not, so I won't speculate there. Um, Goat Island, reserves. Um, well, I mean, reserves, res the reserves. So I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure. It'd be interesting to see. Hi, John. Just in terms of gathering the data and, and what you were doing now, what you're doing out there, um, tanking goats. I mean, how the mechanics of that? I mean, how many of you are there out doing it, and, and so forth? Okay, yeah. So with the the tagging, um, where was the picture of that? 
Yeah, so we, um, that was quite a logistic effort actually. We chartered um, two or three of these um, commercial longline vessels simultaneously. So we would, off each vessel, we would set around two and a half thousand hooks a day. So they'd be usually in the water by about 6.30 in the morning. And then you start pulling them back in. And we have uh, large um, holding tanks on the boats. And um, the deckhands kind of pull the, the fish off the hooks and chuck them in the holding tanks. And we fish the fish out with a little dip net and um, put the tag in and record the number, measure the fish, GPS coordinate, and then the fish goes back over the side as quickly as possible. Um, so they were some rather tiring trips, I can definitely attest to that. Um, to get 10,000 of them out there, it took us a number of months from about November through till March, I think. Um, not working the whole time obviously, but just when the weather's good. Um, and then for the next three years we have to um, receive uh, the fishermen as uh, the calls from the fishermen as they're catching the fish. Um, there's a phone number on the tag and um, so we have a, a kind of a cell phone that's devoted to that that um, um, speak to the fishermen, take down all the details, send them out a letter, they put a mark on the map of where they caught the fish and it all goes into a database and gets analysed. So, yeah, can, so that would rely on either the recreational fishermen or the commercial fishermen taking the time to do that? Yeah, yeah, and um, we incentivise it by um, putting, putting them in a prize draw. So we gave away um, a couple of rod and reel sets every month for um, two years, I think. It was a lot of rod and reels. Um, <laughs> we, yeah, and we, we, had, we had a really great response. We, um, you know, 1,000 tags, 10% 10, 10 of, of what went out. That was, that was really good. Um, I'll just contrast that with, um, uh, so this, this was a tagging program to get it movement. Um, so that's why I've got these external yellow dart tags, they're called. Um, the tags that are used for tagging programs to estimate biomass, that's the, the best way for the snapper stock to try and estimate the biomass is, is a tagging program. Those tags are internal, they're cryptic, so you wouldn't know if you caught one. They are a small plastic um, capsule about the size of a grain of rice. I've got a coil of wire in there. And what we do is uh, we have only in commercial sheds we have tag readers, so they activate that coil of wire by um, the current and um, it kind of blips the number on the tag back and it gets recorded. And we know the amount of fish that is going through those readers um, and we can scale things up from there to get an estimate of uh, how many fish are getting recaptured. And that allows us to, with a whole series of very complicated assumptions that I don't understand, that allows us to get to what we think the biomass is for um, snapper stock. So the last time that happened in snapper one was about 1994. There are other ways of estimating biomass. Um, this tagging program is really, really expensive. Um, and it happened on the west coast in about 2001 was the last time that a large tagging program for biomass happened over there. And if there's one thing that you didn't understand about the fishery, but just one reason why you go fishing with these the fish Yep, yep. So, um, about 20 years ago, um, I wasn't involved in it, but there was a study near Kawo Island where they had large sea cages and they went and caught fish like this with long lines and different methods and they, um, they tagged them and they put them in these cages and monitored their survival. Um, I suppose one of the most important things that came out of that was that if the fish was gut hooked, well, it's not usually actually in the guts, it's just at the back of the throat near the gills. If a fish had, was hooked deeply like that, it had a that was, it really did affect the survival of the fish. That and if the fish was caught from deeper water, so over 20 metres, um, it would have a lower survival probability because um, these fish have a, a swim bladder, so like it's a bladder full of air and that expands as the pressure reduces as the fish come up and it ruptures and um, the fish often can't get back down because they've got so much air trapped inside them. So they were the two most important things that came from that. If the fish didn't have either of those issues, I think the survival rate of a released fish was about 8%, somewhere around about there. About 8%, um, oh sorry, 8% 8, 8 mortality, sorry, so 92%. <laughs> That's important. Um, so when you're releasing your fish, uh, I, mean, I, can, I can run through, through that. So you'll, you'll notice that here we've got basically dishwashing gloves on. So um, 
Uh, people say use a wet rag. I, that's definitely better than using bare hands. Um, your hands are warm, they can actually um, kind of burn an imprint into the fish. But what we're trying to do with the, with the rubber gloves, apart from stopping the heat transfer, is to also um, stop the um, removing the kind of the protective mucus layer of the fish. Um, so handling your fish, if you're catching it and releasing it, is important. You've got to be gentle with the fish. Uh, don't touch the gills, don't put your hand inside the gills. Uh, don't hold the fish by the tail like that. Um, or don't touch the eyes. Um, and if you, you know, if you if you're going to go as far as wearing dishwashing gloves, that'd be good. Otherwise, a, a wet rag. Um, and with the swim bladder, the, the embolism problem, um, there's a couple of ways around this. If if you can get the fish back in the water quickly, they often have enough energy for a couple of tail beats, and that's often all they need just to get down and get a little bit of pressure on them that will compress their swim bladder. Whereas if you take, take photos and, and then release, they're often really tired and they can't do that. Um, but you can also vent the swim bladder yourself. There's venting tools that are available now that you can buy um, on, online. I'm not sure if there are any shops. But uh, what, don't prick the, um, the stomach that comes out the mouth. That's often what people do with a fish hook. That's actually the stomach, not the swim bladder. Swim bladder is kind of at the top of the gut cavity up here. So if you have a venting tool, um, look into it online. If you're releasing a lot of fish, you can let the air out of the swim bladder with that, and that helps the fish get back down and survive them. And we um, we vent we vented pretty much all of the fish that we caught um, for this tagging here. Thank you. Cheers. No, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>